Hi, welcome to The Blame Game. I'm Maria from Pax8 Academy, and here we have... Nathan from Pax8 Academy also. Fabulous. I think today we've had a few really good discussions. Um, a lot of ours come down to various forms of communication as a, as a, as a, as a, a problem solver. Um, but today we were talking about setting expectations. Who sets it? Who's responsible? Um, I know that we've both seen clients' uh, expectations differ from the company's expectations. Um, Nathan, I think you've got a few tales from the trenches. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much time we want to <laughs> go over that. Um, but uh, yeah, one, one big thing is uh, client expectations, you know, and there can be misalignment between what they expect to get and what the reality of it is. Um, Sometimes that's just that they have their own inbuilt expectations and they're always going to want more uh, for whatever reason. But when it comes to expectations that we set, I wanted to ask and discuss who is setting or who should be setting those expectations. Uh, so Tales from the Trench, I was just talking to you about um, projects or services that I get sold on and I'd be a subject matter expert as an engineer because it sold it got us onto the, you know, the account or onto the project. Um, reality is maybe I haven't touched it in two, three, four, five years, and I've got to go on site tomorrow and uh, consult, you know, their senior management or their technical leadership on how they could do this project better. Uh, was able to pull it off um, with a bit of smoke and mirrors, but I have seen it where it causes a lot of disruption and problems uh, particularly within MSPs, um, particularly around third-party software applications that aren't in your typical technology stack that you have to be aware of as you're transitioning them and onboarding them. Uh, so, you know, scenarios of you're, you're scoping out the project, sales goes and has a talk to the client. Oh, yeah, this is going to take us around four weeks. We've got a guy who knows this inside and out. He's our expert. Gets to the point where it's sold, handed over the fence to projects, Oh, well, I've touched it once and it was five years ago. Uh, and this 10 hours to do it seems a little bit slim. We've got to do testing. We've got to do verification. I don't understand the application anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Um, pretty big problem statement, I suppose. What yeah, so would that be it? Yeah. that, it, I guess, I guess if it's a new product that as an MSP we're selling, that's going to be different to onboarding a client who has mm. something that that isn't in our normal stack, mm. um, or 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 su yeah, supporting supporting a product that we've not got enough experience in. Um, we'd hope that after you know listening to our last few videos, um, if you're setting up a new, if you're introducing a brand new. Uh, vendor into your stack, product, um, or, or an update of, of that, you're making sure that you've got the appropriate training and a communication mm. and scoping and all of those things. So that I think the new product is probably covered. But yeah, a client comes to us and they've got a crazy legacy system from mm. that's industry specific and mm. we don't have enough skills. What, what do we do? What do we do? Is that is that part of the onboarding scoping, would you say? Well, there definitely should be something like that to some extent uh, with, uh, you know, uh, discovery and assessment of what applications they have. And from there, you know, determining what's going to be in scope and out of scope of the agreement. But some of, you know, these organisations the technology they're working with, they may have agreements with their previous provider where they did do the support and maintenance and upkeep. And uh, if, if you're going to drop it, are they going to be happy with that? Who else is going to pick it up? <laughs> um, sorry, we're not going to look after any of your line of business apps because we don't understand them. Um, big breakdown, I, I think I see, well, big breakdown I, I see is with our understanding of within the business, how they operate, uh, not everyone it's not, you're not an MSP supporting other MSPs where you get the business and you get the tools in and out. They have, you know, specific 
like you said, industry specific tools, technology. Uh, how do we, how do we at least make it a little bit safer for ourselves with some of, you know, these clauses, but in that assessment, identify, we don't know anything about this. We don't have anyone who knows anything about this. We're willing to pick it up, but what can we do to make it safer? Okay, so as a, as a salesperson, I'll sit in a meeting and it might be an initial meeting or, a, you know, in the, in the early days before we've uh, come to an agreement and I'll say to the client, so why are you, why are you leaving your current MSP? Mm -hmm. what, uh, and we'll break that down and it won't just be like a, the vibe of the thing. No, what didn't they do? What did they miss? You know, is it just about cost? Okay, it's just about cost. Well, mm. let's let's look at that. But um, more often than not, it's it's you know we found that they wouldn't support X or mm. um, you know sometimes it's obviously there's there's a breakdown in relationship and that that's the key driver. But um, if they if they say oh well they 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 will no longer support this legacy on prem da 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 and you go well neither will we. Yeah. So you're setting that expectation straight off the bat. Like, in fact, you probably, the recommendation would be, they're not your ideal client. If you don't want to do on-prem work, don't, don't engage with them because that's, that's their expectation. Um, so I think that those conversations should happen in before you even sign with a client. Why, why do you want to come to us? What did the last, your last provider not do for you? Um, and will we do it? So, um, it, it, it's actually a good thing to be completely honest with them. Um, yeah. and if they say, well, we want someone who's an expert in our line of business software and you're not that expert and you, 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 you know, you don't have that as part of your absolute expertise, yeah. why are you telling them you can do it? Yeah. 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 Um. I don't know if we've talked about this in previous um, sessions, but one of the things that I give or work with partners through is, you know, those assessments of how feasible offering projects or services are to a to a client before you get it to the point where you sign on. Um, so, you know, asking those things like, do we understand their business and how it operates? Do we understand the tools or technology that we're going to have to be using? Um, if we haven't done this before, are we going to do it again? You know, if you're working with, you know, accounting companies or you're working with legal, there'll be some things that carry over, you know, business to business or medical or, you know, whatever, whatever type of business there is, you might be able to say specifically, yes, we do have some um, experience with product A and B, but we don't want to become generalists that know, you know, all the way up to pro product Z as well. So um, I, th I think that's a big part of it is actually working through and qualifying some of those things ahead of time and involve your engineer or involve, um, you know, your service or projects department as well. When before, you know, setting the promise that we've got an expert actually verify that we do have an expert uh, who, who, or someone who at least understands it enough. Um, ask the team, have we even ever touched anything like this technology before um, from a project side? If we have done it, what went well with our implementation or our cutovers and onboarding, what went wrong, collecting lessons and identifying where you did have breakdowns so that you can use them to address future scopes, address future risks as well. Another thing I've been working through a lot lately is uh, just working through what you're going to put in as like risks and assumptions. So looking at all the little parts that are going to make up this project to be successful and going, what could go wrong with this? Or what has gone wrong with this in the past? What could go wrong with this? You know, what's a dependency? You're uh, installing, uh, let's say, uh, access points. How high are the ceilings? Um, are they going to need to be power over Ethernet? Or are they going to be plugged into a wall? If they're plugged into a wall, do we have enough power sockets? If they're going to be plugged into, um, you know, over Ethernet, do we have enough PoE capacity on the switches? Do we need to buy more switches? Um, you know, putting a whole bunch of computers in an area you've never been in before um, and they've never been in before. Do we have wall ports? Do we have access points? Do we have, um, you know, power outlets? All, all those kind of 
basic things to cover off throughout as well. Yeah, and, and those sorts of things can be created as checklists, which yep. they can actually be provided to the client. Our clients aren't quite as silly as sometimes we uh, think they might be. Um, mm. You know, they they hire us because we're experts in the IT space. We can do things that they either don't have time to do or, or don't know how to do. Um, mm. And But we can say things like, do you know what? to deploy whatever it is we're doing, this is the process that we go through. This is the checklist. And it doesn't necessarily have to be as detailed as we might follow, but it mm. says, you know, there's these 10 steps and these steps require us bringing in outside people. And we all know that it's difficult to coordinate contractors. So, you know, we might need to bring an electrician in or a cable or, a, you know, we might need to be working with your internet service provider to make sure X, Y, Z. These are the steps and it, you know, there, there is a, there is a potential time blowout in mm. these just based on having to liaise with different people. Yeah. That up front for a client is fabulous because then that you've, you've set their expectations. Yeah. And it shows you got your stuff together too. It's not just a, yeah. <laughs> You're not just making excuses because as a client, you go, yeah, no problem. No, yeah, uh, cool. We'll have it for you next week. And then yeah. and then next oh, week they call and they go, this? Yeah. where is it? And you go, oh, yeah, yeah no, because that cabler can't make it for two weeks. Mm. And they're like, what cabler? At what mm. point did you tell me that you needed to bring them in? Mm. You know, yeah. whereas if you set out and you say, here's our checklist, this is what we work off. That's mm. setting expectations for the client and it's setting expectations for your staff. It's not making them run around. Um, yeah. and... <laughs> Going back to the initial question we're asking, uh, who sets the expectation? I would say you're our account manager, the account manager or salesperson. Okay. I'm, I'm, as we talk through it, Yes, I think the the less it's actually less important who sets the uh, expectation, but how qualified is the expectation before it goes to the client? So yes, could come from the account manager, and yeah, you know, that, that's fine. But are they informed enough to be making that expectation, such as what we're talking around with? We've got a team of experts. Do you know the skills of the team? Um, we'll do it by this time. Do you know what the capacity and availability of the team is? Those those types of things all need to be, you know, ticked it, off. So it doesn't again, hurt if you're sitting in with a client and the client says, "I, oh, you know, I can sign now." Um, mm. What what are the expert? You know, when am I going to have my product? When am I going to have my service? It doesn't hurt as a salesperson to say, "I need to go back to the office and sit down with the team to make sure that I'm giving you the correct answer." Mm. That's also setting expectations. Yeah. Um, so that that's actually a positive. Yeah. And you could even go one step further and set the expectation of when you'll let them know the expectations. <laughs> I'll go back and talk <laughs> to the team and I'll have an update for you, you know, 4 p.m. tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you've got a pre-built um, sales, uh, but, discovery or scoping or, you know, expectation setting guideline internally. Um, I mean, that could be part of it. You could say, well, these are the products. Here's my expectations. You know, this is what we're selling to the client. Some of them will just be check, check, check. That's an easy one. We know how that works. Some of them might require intervention or discussion between teams. Mm -hmm. That That's not a, you know, setting an expectations checklist for internally would work well mm, yeah okay cool i think that's i think so so i guess it's not setting the expectation it's communicating the expectation so the expectations would be set as a team yeah but the yeah and then we communicate them to the client and it's really however you whoever the most appropriate is to communicate those usually it would be the account manager or the salesperson mm. Usually until it becomes a project and then it's the project manager to manage yep. those expectations. That's right. That's right. Reassess, so. 
Yeah. But what you don't want is me going off and selling something and promising that it'll all be delivered by lunchtime tomorrow. And then you going, hang on yeah. a minute, this is a 40 hour project. Where did that come from? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, again, the, the, the crux I think is it's, it's not so much around who sets the expectation, but um, you know, where are they getting that expect, you know, where are they getting the information to set that with the client? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much.